So far, we have been discussing pure or intrinsic silicon. Now it's time to start adding impurities. So when we looked at semiconductors and compared them to insulators, we said that the most important difference between them is the amount of energy in the band gap. Insulators generally have a larger band gap than semiconductors, so large in fact that at room temperature or even at operating temperatures for uh, electronics, there are no charges in semiconductors and thus their conductivity is null. If we look at this table, it shows us a bunch of semiconductors and insulators. So we have silicon, germanium, uh, which are elemental semiconductors, meaning they are formed of a single element. And we have gallium arsenide and uh, zinc oxide, which are uh, compound semiconductors, meaning they are formed of a compound of two materials together. Now, uh, semiconductors generally belong to the to group 14 of the uh, atomic uh, of the uh, periodic table. Uh, thus, they have four electrons in the outer shell, allowing them to form the crystal structure with four surrounding uh, atoms forming covalent bonds. But sometimes when you combine group 13 and group 15 uh, elements together, they form a molecule that is equivalent to a group 14 molecule, and thus we have what we call compound semiconductors. If we look at the um, band gap values for silicon, germanium, gallium arsenide, and zinc oxide, we are generally talking about um, uh, uh, band gap values between 0.5 electron volt and under 4 electron volt. When we start looking at uh, insulators, and we can have elemental insulators like diamond or uh, compound insulators like silicon dioxide and silicon nitride, both of which will be very important when we start to make devices, we find that the band gap energy is much higher than in semiconductors. Silicon dioxide, for example, has a band gap of 9 electron volt, which makes it a very comfortable insulator. There's no way there's going to be thermal generation at this kind of band gap level. But there's a question about carbon in the form of diamond. So carbon is a very interesting element. It could sometimes be a conductor, not even a semiconductor, a conductor, as in the form of uh, graphite. But when it forms a, um, when it forms a crystal structure, as in the case of diamond, it is generally thought of as an insulator. This is even though carbon has four electrons in the outer shell, and even though when it forms diamond, it has a crystal structure that is incredibly similar to that of silicon. So why do we consider diamond an insulator, even though its band gap level is actually pretty close to that of, of um, for example, zinc dioxide? So what distinguishes, uh, electron, uh, distinguishes uh, uh, semiconductors from insulators is another factor. The, the thing that makes semiconductors in interesting is not that they have an intermediate uh, conductivity, it's not that their conductivity is a function of temperature, it is the fact that their conductivity is extremely sensitive to impurities. So with the controlled addition of very certain impurities, we can create silicon that is much more conductive than pure silicon. But not only that, we can also create silicon that, that whose conductivity is of a different type, meaning that we can create silicon which has a lot more electrons than holes, or silicon that has a lot more holes than electrons. So insulators are not only characterized by the lack of, uh, by the large band gap, they are also characterized by the lack of proper uh, dopants. Dopants are impurities which, uh, when added to a semiconductor, will increase its conductivity dramatically. For group 14 elemental semiconductors, donors and acceptors, the dopants, come from groups 13 and 15. So the two groups right next, left and right of uh, the elemental semiconductor. For uh, 12, 15, compound semiconductors, dopants come from groups 11 and group 16. So it's always the groups to the left and to the right of the semiconductor group that give us the proper doping or the proper impurity. So we divide dopants or impurities into two types, donors and acceptors. There's 
a quantity here called ionization energy, which is measured in electron volt. If you look at the values of the ionization energy here, they are obviously small. We still have to understand what ionization energy means. So let's look here at a silicon crystal into which a donor atom has been added. So we said donors come from group 15, which is uh, the group right to the right of the uh, uh, silicon group. So if silicon nu nuclei have uh, 14 atoms and we drew a dotted circle around the nucleus and around the internal orbits uh, to form something that has a, um, a net charge of plus 4q, we can do the same with the donor. So a donor atom now has a um, inner orbits and a, and a nucleus that have a net charge of plus 5q and it has five electrons in the outer shell by definition because it's a group 15 element and therefore if you look at the donor atom overall the donor atom is electrically neutral electrical neutrality is a very important concept there's zero net charge in the donor atom if we insert donors at a low concentration in the silicon crystal then what happens is that occasionally we are gonna replace a silicon atom in the crystal structure with a donor atom the donor atom has five electrons in the outer shell four of these electrons will form covalent bonds with the surrounding silicon atoms and there will be one electron which does not form a covalent bond this electron is not as strongly bound to the atom, to the donor atom, as the electrons that form covalent bonds because they do not participate to the formation of a bond. These electrons are thus very easy to free up. In fact, there's very little energy that we need to attract from um, the environment, from thermal energy, in order to free this electron and for this electron to become available for current conduction. How much energy do we need to give to do this? This is the ionization energy that we saw in the table. It's a small amount of energy, usually less than 0.1 electron volt. Notice that this is much less than the band gap energy of silicon, which was needed to create electrons and holes by thermal generation. Now, this free electron that was freed from the uh, donor atom does not leave behind a hole, because a hole is defined as an empty location in um, in a covalent bond. If you look here, all four covalent bonds are good. They are still there. So this electron was formed without the creation of a corresponding hole. So we have a free electron without a corresponding hole. This doesn't mean that holes are not created in this kind of structure. Sometimes some of the covalent bond electrons will also become free, leaving behind holes. This is the thermal generation mechanism, which still exists. However, the proportion of electrons that are created this way is much smaller than the proportion of electrons created from donor atoms. And in general, we have electrons being created, leaving behind holes, and electrons being created without holes. And so we know that in this type of silicon, N is, is going to be greater than P. The concentration of electrons is going to be greater than the concentration of holes. And so we call this type of, of silicon N-type silicon. The silicon that is whose properties are dominated by free electrons rather than holes, because it actually doesn't only have more electrons than holes, it has much more electrons than holes. Notice that the material overall, if we draw a black box around the entire material, it is still going to be um, electrically neutral. So what that means is that the net charge here is going to be zero. Now, any electron that is freed by thermal generation is balanced out by the hole it leaves behind so that their net charge is still zero. How about this electron that was freed from the donor atom? When it was freed from the donor atom, what happened is that the, um, that the donor atom was left forming four covalent bonds with the surrounding silicon atoms, and it is in this shape. So if you look at this, this box has a net charge. It has a net positive charge of plus Q. It has four electrons and then plus five in the inner circle so it has a plus q net charge so there is still net uh, 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 electrical neutrality the the freed electron left behind a positive ion which is why we call the energy necessary to free that electron ionization energy so it leaves behind a 
positive ion and overall the, the entire material is still electrically neutral. Notice that this ion is charged and so it observes forces when an electric field is applied to it. However, it is massive because it consists of only neutrons and protons and bound electrons and thus it is immobile. Now, if we add a, um, a dopant an impurity from group 13, we call it an acceptor. And the acceptor has a plus 3q in the inner circle and only three electrons in the outer shell. Three, these three electrons will form three covalent bonds with the surrounding uh, silicon atoms and there will be an empty location in the final covalent bond. This empty location is a hole and this hole has been created without an, a corresponding free electron being created which means that P is going to be much greater than N. As an N-type silicon, this doesn't mean that this kind of silicon, which is called P-type, does not have electrons. Electrons are still generated by thermal generation, but it just means that holes are much more numerous. As soon as an electric field is applied, some electron from some surrounding sil silicon atom is going to be attracted, and we are going to end up with a, an acceptor atom that looks like this. Now this acceptor atom has donated a hole that now travels through the crystal structure and it itself is now left with a negative net charge of minus Q. So we have created a negative ion and a hole. These two will balance each other out so that the material as a whole remains electrically neutral.